good evening. Imagine we could actually build a system of schools that lived up to the promise of higher education in the 21st century, right? A system of schools that set up every single student who enrolled in it for success, unlike the schools we have today in higher education, where most students who enter it get no credential at all when they leave. Most students that enter it are left with a mountain of student debt. Now, I actually think we can do this, right? I'm, I'm part of a team of people in downtown San Francisco that are working on this problem. But here's one thing I know about it. In order to do this, we're going to have to confront, our society is going to have to confront, head on, the pernicious idea that some people aren't smart enough to be successful, that intelligence, that human intelligence is something that is fixed and unequally apportioned among groups of people. And I want to talk about this a little bit from a personal experience. This isn't just theory for me. I was in the first generation of students that could attend desegregated schools in the city of Boston. I was born in Boston, grew up in a housing project in one of the toughest neighborhoods on the East Coast. And let me put this in perspective, right? In 1954, the US Supreme Court handed down the Brown v. Board of Education decision. And what they said in a nutshell was that apartheid was outlawed in public schools in the US. But they also said, implement this decision with all deliberate speed. Now, I'm, gonna re I'm, a, re I'm a recovering attorney, right? I used to practice law. What all deliberate speed means is let's argue about it and take a long time. <laughs> so 21 years later, when I was in the first grade in 1975, the courts ordered the schools to end apartheid. There were police officers at every bus stop in my neighborhood. There were the National Guard on standby. There was, to say that the city reacted violently was an understatement. This, this picture took place, was taken, this incident happened in 1976, when I was a first grade student. It happened exactly two miles from the housing project where I grew up. It actually happened two blocks from where Crispus Attucks was killed. Crispus Attucks was the first person to die in the Boston Massacre, or if you're British, the Boston Riot, depends on your perspective. But it led to the Revolutionary War for Independence. He was the first person to die for freedom in this country. He was black. So I grew up thinking a lot about this image and understanding the irony of it, but more importantly, understanding what was at stake that this was the first real disruptive moment in education, and I had a front row seat on it. So, 12, 12 years later, when I graduated, for, oh, and by the way, let me explain what's in this picture. This is a picture of an anti-busing rally. This is a young student who's taken a swipe at a civil rights attorney, the black guy, who's dodging the pole, right? That guy is a civil rights attorney, and that flagpole has the US flag on it. Think about it, this is what's at stake. So 12 years later, the very people who led this movement in my community said, OK, you guys are now the first generation of people that could finish. We want to talk to you. We've identified a handful of you as leaders. And we want you to be, we're going to come up with a term and call it social entrepreneurs. And I thought, that sounds, yeah, I want to be one of those, right? And so they said to us, listen, you need to understand something. Because some of you need to go out and build the future. But we want you to know something about this future. Right? We don't think this is going to be about civil rights anymore. Here's the secret. We're not going to say this in public, but we know there's going to be fights, and we know we're going to continue to have lawyers go to court and argue that you guys should be able to go to school. This is going to go on for a while, but this is not really where the action is. It's really about this paradigm, and I'm going to share these two paradigms. It's a fight over beliefs about human intelligence, because underneath this picture is the idea that, and the, me and the message that you guys heard is that we don't want these dumb kids in our community bringing down our standard of education, right? The message is that human intelligence is fixed, and you're going to have to disabuse yourselves of that, because some of you are underperforming. And you're also, if you're going to build institutions, you're going to have to build them rooted on the right set of ideas. So I'll just go over this really quickly. There's two competing paradigms. One of them says that intelligence is, human intelligence is, 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 is fixed, right? and it's measurable. We can tell you how smart you are, right? It's a fix, it's apportioned unequally among people and among groups. You know, there are some smart folks and some not so smart folks, and we can kind of tell you who they are. Let, let me tell you what the mathematical expression of this is, right? We can take your performance data and plot it on a bell curve. We take information about your performance and extrapolate it and say, 
this is your ability, right? Because in a system where we believe intelligence is fixed, our job is to help, is to let you guys know that some of you have it and some of you don't, and we just don't want you to waste your time anymore. And this is kind of what's been referred to throughout the evening. We've, we've kind of danced around this, but I want to talk about where it came from, right? This is an idea that's been around a long, long time, right? There's also a new paradigm. This is what they told us. Here's the good news. There's a new paradigm. And this new paradigm says that intelligence is malleable. It's flexible. It can be developed through effort over time. Right? It is something that all of you can work against and develop. And what you're looking at here is another expression or another way to use data, right? Performance data. This is a system that we've developed in my company, and we call it the R score, right? And what it tells you is here's, here is where you are today relative to your goal. And the system increases the, the difficulty of, of the, it gives you information about it, and it gets more difficult as you move through it, right? It figures out what you need to know and what you don't know, and we're giving you information that you can use to improve yourself, not information to help you understand where your place is but to help you understand how to improve. What we're telling young people in our system is you can master difficult subjects. And our job is to keep you motivated, keep you in the zone, right? And if you fall out of the zone, to get you back in it. Now, what's the fallout? What's the impact of this old paradigm? Because part of it is school doesn't work for people, so some folks check out and they say, hey, this doesn't work for me, right? I don't like how it works, but there's other like fall out of this that's, that's had an enormous impact on our society and on the community I grew up in, right? 30% of U.S. high schoolers don't graduate. Okay, that's, that's one implication of the old model, right? In 17 of the large, 50th largest school districts, it's 50% of people who do not get their high school degree. They don't graduate. They drop out. For African Americans and Latinos, it's 50% that actually drop out. So that's okay if you're in 19, like 1950 and the job's being created a blue collar, right? There's plenty of work and it's good paying and you get a pension and right on, you know, and you're retired. If it's in 2011 where the jobs are white collar and you need advanced training and post-secondary training to get those jobs, it's a crisis. So we have a crisis. And by the way, what these folks told me 25 years ago was this is theory. We believe as leaders and social scientists, this is the challenge that you guys are going to face. So we're telling you this as theory. Now, 25 years later, we, we have scientists that can stand up on the stage and tell you there's actually science behind it. Back then it was, you need to make this leap and believe this is what you're going to be dealing with. And so as a result of this, the fastest growing segments of our society are two times more likely to be unemployed, eight times more likely to be imprisoned. And the impact of this is $345 billion a year. Okay, a little perspective, that's greater than the GDP of most countries on Earth. If you went and looked at a list, it's probably greater than every, every country on Earth except the top 40. It's real money, it's not like table stakes, right? So it's a crisis and we're all in it together. So how does this compare to what's happening around the rest of the world? Because this is all self-referential to our country. What does this mean? How does this fit into like what's happening around the globe, right? Um, under 30% of the U.S. population has a college degree today. And that number for the first time is expected to go down because of these demographic shifts. So we'll be the first generation where fewer adults have a college degree than a prior generation. In India and China, it's less than 5%. That number is expected to go up dramatically. To put some actual hard numbers on it, they will need 10 million seats in India in college in the next, by 2020. Right? Their goal is 30 million, because they want to like, make sure they cover the, uh, the hole they have to meet. Right? So conclusion, the game is just getting started. We're out of steam. Everybody else is just getting geared up, and we're out of steam because of our history, because of the ideas that our institutions were built around. Now, here's the good news. Right? Paradigms can be reflected in your business model. Translation, you can have a different idea about the world and build a business model that actually changes it. So here's what, if you were to build a new university today, using this new paradigm, what would it look like? Because I think we can. First off, it would be accredited and self-paced and competency-based. 
And what that means is accredited means it's real, it's recognized. People recognize the value of the degree. It's self-paced. You can go at a pace that's appropriate for you, right? It would also be uh, the coach, the, the, the faculty would function as coaches as opposed to lecturers, right? It would be affordable. In other words, you could pay out of your pocket for this. You don't have to borrow. You don't have to like take out enormous amounts of debt, right? And finally, all the content, all the stuff that's really important, the content, the feedback, the assessments, all the stuff that you need to be, to be successful as a student will be available for free online. Why? Because we can do it and we want you to be successful. That's why. So that's what the new university would look like. Now, we're trying to build one of these and we're gonna launch it in a few months. We're right here in San Francisco. Let me talk to you about, let me compare that university to the existing model, right? In the old model, it's pay first, access later. In the new model, it's access first, pay later. In the old model, there's a significant cost of failure. If you fail, I'm gonna make it really hard on you. And by the way, I will give you the privilege of paying for the class again that you just failed. Because <laughs> that's what, we're gonna help you out. In the old model, right, time is a constraint. Everybody gets tested on the same day, and if you, has anybody ever seen the commercial where you stay at Holiday Inn and you get really smart, right? Okay, if you stay at Holiday Inn on December 11th and the test is on the 12th, you get an A, great. If not, your problem. So you either know it or you don't on the day that I'm testing you, right? In our model, time's irrelevant. Take as much or as little time as you need. Our job is to keep you in the flow and get you there as quickly as you can or as you need to, right? And here's what's important that's not up here. In the old model, we measure input. We tell you how smart we think you are, right? In the new model, we tell you about your performance. And we give you information that you can use to succeed, right? And so, well, all right, I'm sorry. Yeah, and so what does this mean, right? I would say we now know we have a choice about which paradigm we can embrace. And I would challenge you to embrace the new paradigm and build institutions, those of you who want to be entrepreneurs, that are consistent with it. Thank you. <laughs>